going. We're a small but high quality band here. And <laughs> I'm delighted to be able to have Ken and Michael talk to us about a remarkable project, which they long series, really, but I guess really comes together as a project and certainly in its impact did. Uh, the work that they did at the Seattle Times, which won this, which is winning, has been <laughs> notified of winning, and tomorrow we'll receive the Selden Ring Investigative Award for, for 2012. So, um, so Michael Behrens and Ken Armstrong and Methadone and the Politics of Pain and whatever you are inclined to tell us, we're here to hear and then have a discussion. All the secrets of business. <laughs> that's, that's what you're going to get. How everybody can become a <laughs> fine investigative reporter. So, uh, we were just talking about our history, so I guess I'll, I'll start off a little bit with my history. And uh, Ken and I have some parallel history, but we also started off you know, differently. I started uh, in the journalism business, much like you guys probably are sitting in college here. What year is most of the students here? Sophomores, juniors? And some grad students. Grad students. Yeah. Grad students. Grad students. Okay, grad students. Well, I was actually in my junior year at Ohio State University. And there was still this television show on television called Lou Grant. You know, you see that on Netflix, you know? And so, so I'm watching Lou Grant, and I'm in a, like a pre-law thing. I'm going through accounting and calculus and all this stuff. And you know, I always wanted to write, but I'd always heard there was no money in it. You know, and I wanted to go into a profession with money. And and I watched Lou Grant. And I said, you know, I really do want to write. So I joined the local SBJ student group, and then I thought I'll go down and apply at the local newspapers for a job. You know, let's see if I can just get a clerk's job. So I go down, there were two newspapers in Columbus, Ohio at the time. One was a morning paper, one an afternoon. I went to the morning paper, and to my surprise, they took me right up to the city room and gave me a typing test, which I wasn't prepared for, and I flunked. And I was like, holy crap. And it's, it's like they wanted 33 words a minute, and I typed like 29, you know? So I was like, if I get up higher, can I come back? Yeah, you can. But you know, it was the typical scene from the from a movie of the crusty city editor singing, and they put me right in front of him with a typewriter. And, and you know, I was so nervous. So I go up to the afternoon paper, which is the bigger paper in town, the Columbus Dispatch, and uh, they tell me that there's a one-year waiting list just to apply for copy boy. You know, and this is 1980 when I applied. In 1981, they call me and say, uh, we have an opening, and, and, and I'm not doing real well in college at this point, so it seems like a really good job. It pays minimum wage. And, and so I went into the Columbus Dispatch as a minimum wage employee. My job was to set up the Christmas tree on the holiday, <laughs> deliver the mail each day, which is a highly political process. If you ever get into the newsroom, you'll know that reporters measure their mailboxes against each other to see who's got the little bit bigger slot. And so that, that was impressive. And then I had to go down to the presses and get the papers each day and deliver them to all the reporters. So <clears throat> that was my genesis. And then. And I, I became an editorial assistant in 81. By 83, I became a reporter and started on the police beat. And so a lot of the things we're going to talk about today, uh, I learned in the first three or four years of my job in the 1980s. A lot of the skills I learned, a lot of the investigative mindsets, you know, all come from the beginning. So uh, how did you start? I'm, I'm not even sure. <laughs> oh, I, I started by dropping out of everything possible. I, uh, I went to law school and dropped out, and then I joined the Peace Corps and I dropped out. <laughs> and uh, you know, as my parents were looking on with amusement and thinking, what is he doing? What's going to happen to him? I wound up at a small paper in Colorado um, called the Valley Courier. I'm sure you've all heard of it. Uh, it's an Alamosa. It was a 5,000 circulation paper, and I lived in a trailer and earned five dollars an hour. And I had the most unusual beat I've ever had. It was sports and courts. Um, I covered courts in the afternoon, and then I covered high school sports at night, and it was great fun, and I absolutely loved it, and then after that, I just worked at a whole succession of papers. This was back in the era when it was kind of expected that you would start a small paper and then just progressively climb the ladder, and I worked at papers in Idaho, in California, New York, Alaska, Virginia, Chicago, and then in Seattle, um, those things, it, it's less common to see that these days, you know, where you, you, you go from paper to paper. But I wouldn't have missed it for the world. Because well, I would have worked in three papers, and Columbus being the first, and, and I always joke because I've never actually applied for a job uh, in newspapers. So as an editorial assistant, my first journalistic job was to go get the pictures of dead people each day. And so it was a task the reporters didn't want to do. So if there was a drowning or a car wreck, and they called the family and said, do you have a picture of little Tommy? And the family said, yes. Hey, Mike, 
come here. And, and then I go drive out to the home and go pick up the picture. Because the reporters didn't want to have to confront the difficult task of, of getting you know, in a difficult situation. And I learned you know, a lot of lessons in these little things of, of how to deal with people and, and empathy, you know, which there's nothing wrong with empathy in this profession. In fact, it's a huge asset to really show some of that. So I think, uh, you know, I've told this story before, but one of the instrumental moments of my, my career was on the police beat when there was a, a woman who was re re calling the police department every day saying that there was a uh, death ray from outer space coming down and hitting a rabbit in her field. <laughs> and this ray would hit the rabbit and keel over and die. And she'd call week after week and the police would show up. Uh, well, the police finally showed up and they were prepared to, to uh, cite her for being a public nuisance at this point. And the officer shows up and I pick up the story after the fact, but the police report, when you read it in the police language, you know, I arrived at the home and, you know, 1600, I observed a ray of light come from the sky, and I observed the ray of light hit a rabbit, I observed the rabbit keel over and die. <laughs> <laughs> then the rest of the police report says, I also observed a police chopper up in the air, and I noticed that the guys up in the police chopper were target shooting rabbits from the chopper. And the woman uh, never saw the chopper, she just saw the rabbits in the light. <laughs> and it was, you know, it, it was a hilarious story, and it was, I was doing an obituary on one of the officers who was involved in this, this target shooting, and it was just one of those old throwbacks in the 1980s of what the cops did in their spare time. But it, it really impressed on uh, looking at multiple perspectives on stories and not, you know, dismissing something just because it sounds crazy. And those are the kinds of lessons you really learn by experience, you know, in this business. And, and so I think Ken and I uh, both worked at the Chicago Tribune at, at, you know, at the same time. We actually never worked together at the Tribune. But I went to the Columbus Dispatch, the Chicago Tribune, to the Seattle Times. And I think one of the specialties, and I think this methadone project highlights this, is it's story, sort of a story that's a hidden in plain sight. You know, it, it's one of those stories that's been sitting there. Anyone could have seen it or done it. Uh, it wasn't a deep throat per se. And, and Ken and I had teamed up a couple of years ago on a story on uh, MRSA, MRSA, methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus, and uh, that was another story that was just kind of sitting out there in plain sight. And methadone had some shades of that. Um, the story for us uh, began with an email. Yeah, I guess it's not very exciting. I wish that we had a deep throat in a garage, you know, who whispered his <laughs> secrets. But it actually, it was an email from a doctor uh, in Seattle who sent this this three-page email to me. And he said, hey, I, I know a source from one of your previous stories. He suggested I give you uh, a contact here. And he wrote this incredibly dense, you know, medical jargon-filled email, something about methadone. And I couldn't figure out exactly what he was trying to say. And I don't know about you, but uh, um, has anyone been in pain here and had pain pills? What kind of drugs did you get? Anyone get methadone? Because I think Ken and I were both astounded to find out that methadone is just a commonplace pain drug today. When, when I hear methadone, I think heroin addicts and, and those seedy neighborhood clinics and you know people lined up to, to get off their drug addiction. And, and everyone I talk to, as soon as you say methadone, oh, you're doing sort of about heroin addicts. No, you know, it's about pain. Did you know that millions of people you know, nationwide are getting methadone as a pain drug? And, and why? And that's because uh, methadone is so incredibly cheap. You know, what point did we finally end up with a graphic? It was, it was less than a dollar a dose, and it was 12 times as cheap as oxycodone. Right. Oh, wow. So it's, it, you know, by far of the, the, the most powerful pain drugs, the opiates, as they're called, methadone was the, the absolute cheapest drug on the market. And so you can see why it's incredibly attractive, you know, for governments, wow. you know, who help pay for health care costs. But this email, and I, I don't know, uh, you know, this is, Ken and I both have, you know, our, I think our unique approach is on how we look for stories, and I've actually developed a checklist of things that I look for for what makes a story. But I got this email, and the first thing I looked at was, does this have the elements of a good project? Uh, has anyone done an investigative project here for their newspaper or school publication? or What have you done? Um, I did a lot of investigating in Florida um, for hurricane preparation, yeah. looking at governments and what they were and were not doing to uh, get the communities ready to burn. So how did you sell the story to your editor? Um, if a hurricane comes, we're all going to die. <laughs> <laughs> that probably works. And your grandmother and your mother are going to die. They're in the nursing home, but no one's regulating. <laughs> well, that's 
that's you know actually that goes under the category of relevance. <laughs> that's, that's you know why should I care? You know is it new? Is it something that needs to be exposed? So there, there's this checklist. So one of my main things when I'm looking for a long-term project, and these are discretionary stories, is can it be quantified? Can the story be measured in some way? And and so if you look at journalism that, that really resonates with you versus stories that oh yeah that was good. Um, what you often see is the one that was, oh, that was good, we'll say some or many or about, you know, 1,000 deaths, where the one that's really good will say, hey, we found 416, we found 623, we found, you know, it's that precision journalism. And so I like to look for that component, you know, most any story that I, that I tackle because I think it, it, it gives you a, a foundation and a base that, that's hard to dispute. And so the first thing we did is looked at death certificates and started uh, trying to quantify how many people accidentally die from methadone each year. And one way to do that is to look at death certificates, which are public record in Washington. I know in California death certificates are, are like treasure secrets and, and all that sort of thing, but in many states they are public records. And it, it also, you know, is an illustrative of why, you know, they should be public records because it allows the public to, to peer over government's shoulder and see what's going on, what, what the outcomes of these policies are. So with the death certificates, you know, there's you know, 30 to 40,000 people a year who die in the state of Washington. So how do you call out, you know, who's dying from methadone? And how do you determine whether those were abusers, you know, versus just innocent people who accidentally overdosed on the drug? And I think, you know, in the story, if you've read it or do read it, you know, one of the lines that resonates that, that, that Ken wrote uh, and the top of the story is, you know, the drug's incredibly cheap, you know, and, it, and it's, it's also very lethal, you know, in many ways. And that's that was really the, the linchpin of the story, and that's what we looked for in these death certificates, is how we could determine who was dying from methadone and how they were dying from methadone, more importantly. Is, is, so has anyone done computer-assisted reporting here? Anyone know what that means? So I'm going to say something that's horribly offensive to people, and I say this all the time to students particularly, that if you don't know how to retrieve electronic data, if you don't know how to read it on your computer, you're blocked off from reams of public information for your entire life. If you want to be blind to you know, where public, their treasure troves of public information are, like death certificates and germs, and you know, look at a lot of these stories, you'll see almost all the, the you know, reporters are, are using some form of computer-assisted journalism, or they have someone on their staff who's able to read this data. But if you don't know how to access those death certificates and put them up on your screen and look through them and interview them, so to speak, interview the data, you're, you're locked off from all this public information. So if you're going into journalism, whether it's you know online or newspapers or magazines, I really encourage you to get some of those, those skill sets. It allows you, it's so easy, and, and that's for another session someday. <laughs> you know, five minutes and you can be the most dangerous person in the world. It's all click and point, no logarithms or math. You know, it's just using Excel and access and things like that. But with these death certificates, every death has about, what would you say, 90 pieces of information or so, total, or? Or at least 70 columns. Yeah, 70 columns of, you know, so, so think you're getting seven discrete pieces of information with every death. Time, time they die, the sex, the name, uh, location of death, then then they use codes, medical codes. What was the primary cause of death? What was the secondary cause of death? What was the contributing cause of death? And then more spectacularly, <coughs> physicians or coroners will write notes on the death certificate, a little notes field. Oh, uh, this person, you know, has a history of depression and did this, this, and this. And, and so we have those notes as well in the database. So I instantly can quantify and track, you know, 30,000 deaths at a time year by year. And so I could screen, show me every person who had methadone in their death certificate. Bang. Now I've got a population, you know, of thousands and thousands. Now show me which, how many had methadone where the coroner said this was an accidental overdose versus a suicide. And so bang. Now I've got that population. So it's, it's like whittling it down. And our final number was approximately 2,173. Sorry. 2,173 deaths. We, we narrowed down to our final inventory of deaths of uh, people who died from methadone where the coroner or a medical professional said this was an accidental overdose. And by accident, it means that they, they weren't intentionally trying to hurt themselves. Okay. Uh, and, and then we started looking at the co-factors. Okay, so the people who died accidentally, what was the other factor? We saw a lot of people were on anti-anxiety medicines, depression medicines. And we started doing scientific research. Ken and I both started pulling records. Then we saw 
research that said if you mix these drugs, they're incredibly deadly. Which raises the question, well, why are people mixing these drugs? Do they know better? I mean, they, they weren't trying to hurt themselves, so, so why were they being mixed? Well, we found, you know, doctors were warning patients that if you take methadone, don't, don't take this other stuff. And, and then we started, you know, looking at all those, those cofactors, and that's when, you know, we start seeing, you know, the 2,100 plus deaths, you know, we, we put them on a map, and you saw all these dots on the map, and you could just see them scattered all over the place. And, it's like, wow, it's just, just visually, look how many people are dying that we don't even know that there's this accidental cause of death. That alone is a story right there. You know, so, so one of the things we started doing was, uh, at one point, Ken and I divided up some of the deaths and we just started cold calling families. And, and that was uh, as bad as picking up pictures of dead people. You know, it's, it's not a pleasant task, it's very delicate. And I would say the vast majority of people I called uh, were, pleasant but did not want to talk publicly about the death in their family. These were excruciatingly painful, prolonged deaths in many cases. I mean, the, the circumstances that led to the person being on pain pills, you know, sometimes was a two or three year odyssey at the very least. These were often families who were impoverished and, and had histories in their, their families that they did not want publicized. I know you got several hang-ups, didn't you? Well, what we also found was that that stigma that Mike talked about, how a lot of people associate methadone with these um, addiction treatment centers, um, that mindset exists publicly, and a lot of these families were concerned that by having a loved one linked with methadone, that people would draw the wrong conclusions. They would associate it with pain treatment. They would associate it with addiction. Um, so that was just one further complicated factor. I mean, there were so many reasons families didn't want to talk to us, and we just hit that at every single turn. Ken and I took the deaths and we divided them up into Excel spreadsheets. And Ken took a portion, I took a portion, and we just systematically went down and called family after family. And you know, why are we doing this? One, to gather information, two, to get a better sense of the real circumstances behind these computer pieces of data that we're looking at. And it, it was immensely informative because we saw in some cases where uh, people truly died from accidental overdoses, but it had been such a prolonged traumatic sequence of events that led to the death that the family was just too traumatized, you know, to talk about it. You know, yeah, you know, she lost her job and then she went into depression and, you know, <coughs> we tried for years to help her and, and she just kept taking pain pills and it got worse and then one day she just didn't wake up, you know. And what, what does methadone do, I guess we should say, you know, what, what makes methadone different? Um, they have the pain pills. So how many people have taken pain pills here of some sort? Probably most everyone in some. So, so what did you take? Oxycodone or Oxycontin or Vicodin or Valium or you know any of those. So all those drugs I just mentioned, you take them every 8 to 12 hours typically. And, and the way the drug works is that you take an Oxycodone or Oxycontin and in about 8 hours it dissipates from the body. You take another dose. It's active for about 8 hours to 12 hours. You take another dose. And, and that's how you get your, your pain relief. With methadone, you take a dose of methadone, it stays in your body for up to 91 hours was the max. Up to 128. 128 hours. Uh, Ken found one research, and we went with a more median, I mean, at least. Yeah, the 90, FDA goes with 59 hours. 59. So, and, and while Oxycontin reaches peak pain strength immediately, Methadone takes days to reach its peak effectiveness. Mm -hmm. So you take one and you think, wow, it's not doing very much for me. Uh, and so instead of waiting that 8 to 12 hours, you might pop another one and say, you know, I'm not feeling anything. And you're not realizing that with each and every dose of methadone, you're creating a bigger and bigger reservoir of, of residual drug in your body. So the first week that you start methadone is the most dangerous because every person reacts to methadone differently. And so it's a case-by-case -case basis in that reservoir. It may only take you know, this much of a reservoir to kill me. It might take this much of a reservoir to kill Ken. Uh, so you don't know at what point you're going to go into stress. And the way methadone works is it just shuts off your breathing ability. It, you know, you just essentially paralyzes your ability to breathe. So you, you fall asleep and die, essentially, with methadone. And so we, in the death certificates, we finally, we were looking for some case to, to kind of encapsulize the series. And, and we found these two sisters. And it seemed like the most remarkable journalistic discovery you know, we could find with methadone. We have two sisters in a car crash. They're coming home from a nightclub, and they crash. <coughs> One sister is on uh, Medicaid, 
meaning uh, she's got government subsidized health care, and the other one has private health insurance. The one who gets private health insurance gets oxycodone. The one who's on Medicaid gets methadone. One sister lives, one sister dies. The one who got methadone ended up uh, accidentally overdosing on methadone. Her body just shut down and she died. It seemed to me, it was like, you can't make it up, you know, better than this until you start talking to the family. <laughs> yeah. uh, the, sister, one, the surviving sister wanted to talk, but here's the circumstances. They were both drunk. They were coming home uh, from a nightclub. The crash was because the sister who was driving was drunk and she crashed into a bridge above it. Uh, the one sister who survived was pregnant and lost her baby in the crash. Uh, in addition to that, many of the family members the sisters had lived with, and then the one sister still lived with, had, had backgrounds that, that you would not want published in the newspaper. So the family just shut the sister down and said, you cannot talk about this. You cannot go on the record. And so we lost that case, uh, not being able to talk about that sister. So it was pretty you know, disappointing because we'd been turned down so many times. I'd worked with the sister for weeks. I mean, I talked to her three or four times, and you know, we talked to her for hours, and we really had the story put together. And, even despite the, the alcohol, we thought, well, you know, that's life, you know, these are not perfect people, boys, and, and so that doesn't change the story. But when the family put their foot down, we knew we had a problem. So as we're hunting for, for people who can help us illustrate the story, we uncovered um, the fact that there was a state agency, the Department of Health, that had done a, a I don't want to call it secret, but a, a public a, a study that had not gotten very much notice. It's sort of an internal state study, and it, it showed that um, methadone was killing poor people at higher rates than any other part of the population in the state. And what it showed, I think our, our figure was roughly the Medicaid adult population in the state of Washington is approximately 8% of the entire population, and nearly half of those who died on methadone were on Medicaid. So. The way the way this story is structured, is, and uh, maybe Ken can explain it is, is better than I. The preferred drug list, the concept of the preferred drug list. So you probably never heard of a preferred drug list, because yeah, what what most states have, I think 46 <coughs> states have now, is what they call a preferred drug list. And, and what it is is instances where healthcare is publicly subsidized. It's a list of drugs that are considered to be as safe as others but it's more inexpensive. You know, that way you save taxpayer money by directing people to those drugs. Uh, what was unusual in Washington is that they have a preferred drug list for narcotic painkillers, and they only have two drugs on it. Methadone is one of them, and morphine is the other. It's not unusual to find a preferred drug list with methadone on it, but typically they have a broad inventory. You know, you'll also have three or four or five other painkillers on it. So that way physicians have an, an array of choices. And, and that way when they're dealing with patients who might have cofactors that would be troubling for methadone, for example, they're also on anti-anxiety medications, or you know, they have a, a history of, of depression or a home. They have other choices that would be more suitable uh, in that instance. In Washington, it's morphine or methadone, which is why I think we saw such a high percentage of our, our uh, fatalities that are linked to narcotics being methadone. Um, it's because the physicians just didn't have much in the way of choice. Well, physicians are under great pressure by the state to prescribe the cheapest drug. And that's why the preferred drug list is a really important vehicle. And Ken and I confronted two big issues with this project. One, methadone. Most people misunderstand it. They're going to think heroin. Two, no one's heard of a preferred drug list. And it sounds boring just to say, you know, preferred <laughs> drug list. You know, oh, God. This isn't the stuff of investigative dreams, you know. And and so, you know, how do we bring, how do we pop this to life? And and then it was actually a fellow reporter named Carol Ostrom. She's a healthcare reporter at the paper. And, and a long time ago, she had gotten an email from a woman uh, named Sarah Taylor about the death of her daughter. And Carol shared that email with me. It's funny how emails tend to be our umbilical cords today. And and uh, so I called up this mother, and she said, Yeah, my daughter, Angeline Burrell. Uh, was prescribed methadone and she died. And the more we talked, the more I realized, you know, wow, this is the case we've been looking for. Here's here's the victim who could be you, you know, and that's that's really what you're trying to find. And Angeline Burrell was a dispatcher for the King County Sheriff's Department, 911 dispatcher. And 
she had gallbladder surgery, and the surgeons messed up during the removal of the gallbladder, and they, they snipped the nerve the wrong way. And, and so Angelina's got this pain after her surgery, and no one can explain at first what's going on with her. She's in excruciating pain. So she goes to the doctor, she gets pain pills, and she's on private insurance at this point. She's a, you know employee person. She has a daughter, <laughs> she's bought a home. You know, here's this very productive citizen, but because of this unexplained pain, and because no one can explain it, and she's getting worse, they start thinking that she's a drug seeker. Ah, uh, you know, and this is this is something Ken and I really battled on this project was the stigma where everyone who takes pain pills, there's something wrong with them. You know, why do you need a pain pill? And and it still bugs me when I see all the stories in the media today on prescription drug abuse. It's like they wipe this entire population of patients as, as a problem. Or these are these are people who need to just suck it up, you know, or doctors just need to shut it off. You know, there are a lot of people like that, of course, but there's another population. That's the one we wrote about in this series, and I think that's you know really the public service that we were trying to shine a light on. Of there are people in real pain, and Angeline Burrell was the person. As she 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 their pain got worse and worse, uh, the the establishment started, you know, the stigma against her, and it wasn't until. Finally, that they diagnosed the, the pain, you know, the reason why for her pain that she was legitimized. But at this point now, she's lost her job because she can't work anymore. She's no longer functional as a human being. She's been taking pain pills, and now she's got depression because she's lost her job and she's lost her home. Now she's moved back in with her mom, Sarah Taylor, and and Sarah watches her daughter just slip into this abyss, you know, month by month. She stays in her room most of the day. She reads Patricia Cornwell crime novels. You know, her only entertainment, and she gains, you know, tons of weight. And she's just becoming horrible. And as she lost her her private insurance, she moves over to, to Medicaid. Ken and I were able to get the medical records from the family, and in it, uh, through the University of Washington, they said, well, she's on, I think it was oxycodone, uh, but we're taking her off the oxycodone, we're switching her over to methadone. And in the doctor's notes, it said we advised her that it could potentially be lethal you know, using methadone, you know, but they gave it to her nonetheless, and it was, I believe, two days after she got her medication of methadone from the University of Washington that the family found Angeline in her bed, slumped over, you know, dead. As I said, you just stopped breathing, and she, she was just sitting at the edge of the bed and just died right there, and they found her slump uh, from, from just the inability to move, you know, at this point. And so here's, you know, the death certificate confirmed all the circumstances of death. But here's a woman who, who took legally prescribed medication, and she took it in the quantities that it was prescribed, as told to her by doctors, and she died. And so it became a signature case for us, and it was our lead, you know, example. Uh, there was a lot of pushback from the establishment and doctors, but from to both Ken and I, who told us that we were way off the mark, that methadone is just as safe and effective as any other pain drug out there. And this was the operative phrase, as safe and effective as any other pain killer. And they, they would cite studies, and they had statistics, and they kept telling us there's no difference between methadone and any other pain drug. They're both identical in their safety and efficacy. And then uh, we found that this group of doctors who decide what the preferred drug list is going to be each year, they meet you know, three to four times a year, and they keep transcripts of their, their meetings. Uh, and so we got hold of those transcripts. And when we saw the internal discussions, and Ken really coined it well, uh, here's this really out of sight committee of people you've never heard of from making the most powerful decisions for society. And, and uh, when we got those transcripts, it really opened the door to what they were saying and some of the, the ways that they were sliding around the danger signals of methadone. Whenever it would flare periodically, someone would raise their hand, hey, are a lot of people dying from methadone in Washington? Uh, no, uh, well, uh, I don't think we want to pick on one drug. I think we've got to look at all the drugs. And then they would lapse into this, this you know, jargon-filled explanation that made no sense. And so it was roughly in the, through the midway of this project that I've got all this material, the death certificates, transcripts. And, and it would be tempting to take the transcripts and show, look, they said this, and the Seattle Times found this, and they said this, and the Seattle Times found that. And then Ken joined the project about this point. And this is where he brings his brilliance to the project, because he looked at those transcripts much differently than I did, and he saw something that helped make the story. Um, Mike said something earlier where he was being very charitable. He talked about how he and I both created Excel spreadsheets on these things. I've only created one Excel spreadsheet in my life, and I messed it up. <laughs> so I, I'm one of those people that Mike was describing about. I've always managed to work with people. 
who know how to do these things. That's always been my special skill. Um, one of the things I enjoy working about with Mike about is that whenever I, I work with him, he not only has all of this information available, he has it beautifully organized. He, he not only creates custom databases, he color codes them. You, know, you look at the spreadsheets, and he's got rows that are in yellow, rows that are in blue, and rows that are in red, and he attaches numerical values to different rows in terms of how much uh, promise he thinks particular cases have as potential reporting leads. And it's so much fun to look at them as long as he cracks the code for them. You know, it tells you what the red means and what a number three means and everything. And what, what I've always found is that there's so much information that, that Mike is able to gather so quickly that the, one of the challenges then becomes how do you tell the story? How do you get to the story's core? Particularly when you're dealing with something as dense and complicated as this story was. And particularly when you're dealing with subjects that simply don't have a lot of intuitive appeal. The, the state agency we were writing about here was something called the Pharmacy and Therapeutics Committee. I, I mean, the pharmacy and therapeutics can the, the name alone is enough to induce sleep. You know, so you're, you're writing about a painkiller that people have misconceptions about. You're writing about a state agency that meets in hotel conference rooms, you know, at the, at the Radisson or whatever. Most people associate state politics with what happens on the floor at the state capitol or what happens at Capitol Hill in Washington. But the truth is, a lot of the most important decisions that affect our lives do happen at these faraway conference rooms where reporters rarely show up and, and where people are making the policy decisions that really shapes what kind of medication you're going to be able to get if you happen to be a state employee, if you're on Medicaid or whatever. And, and having those transcripts available was, was immensely helpful to us um, because what we were able to do is we, we, we took all of this data and we, we did a couple of things. One is Justin Mayo, another reporter at the newspaper, who was a computer system reporting specialist, um, he was able to take all of these deaths that Mike had collected and put them on a map. And immediately, we were able to see one of the, the core themes of the project. Um, in the Puget Sound area, there's a long, narrow lake called Lake Washington. And it's about 20 to 25 miles long. And on the west side of the lake is Seattle. On the east side of the lake is Bellevue and a number of other suburbs. Both sides are densely populated, but the east side of the lake is considerably more fluent. Justin flows in all of the deaths. They're marked by dots. And he immediately sees the disparity. On the east side of the lake, there are all of these dots, far out of proportion to what you would expect to see purely by population. On the east side of the lake, very few dots, relatively. So then we started doing a tale of two cities approach, where we took cities that had similar populations, but had very different um, economic backgrounds, you know, where the income levels were significantly different. And you could see the disproportionate impact of the methadone deaths by comparing Bellevue, which is fairly well to do, with Everett, which is not, by comparing Mercer Island with um, Port Angeles. These are towns that in Washington, with our readership, have immediate associations. And people were able to tell through these examples what was happening. So we were able to show that while methadone had killed 2,173 people, that the, the, the biggest toll was taking place in areas that had lower incomes. The other thing we were able to do was to take these transcripts of the P&T Committee, uh, that's the Pharmacy and Therapeutics Committee, and by writing about it chronologically, we were able to show how there were all of these warnings that the committee was receiving over time about methadone and how they were dismissing them. And we were able to take all of this data that Mike had and show that there were questions being asked at these committee meetings where the answers were available simply if they had done the same research that Mike had done. But instead, they either didn't have that information available, they didn't go get it, or they were disregarding it anyway. So we wrote about what happened in 2004, where they received warnings right from the get-go, from the minute methadone goes on for a drug list, but they ignore it. It happens again in 2005, in 2006, in 2009. And we're also able to take this data and shape it into a story. For example, in 2005, it comes up at the meeting that there are all these people in Oregon who are overdosing on methadone and who are dying. 
and, and the committee is concerned, is the same thing going on in Washington? It's a good question. They don't answer it. Instead, they say, well, we don't think we really have a problem here. We don't think that that's an answer we can provide from the data. That would be too difficult of an analysis to do. So at the, at the end of it, they say, well, you know, it sounds like Oregon has a problem, but we do not. Well, in fact, Washington had much more of a problem than Oregon if they had simply done a data analysis. So we were, not able, we were able to not only show the raw numbers annually, we were able to show how the month before that meeting, 28 people died in Washington of methadone overdoses. The day after that meeting, another person died of methadone overdose. So all of these deaths are happening without this committee acknowledging them and without this committee responding to it. And being able to write about it chronologically had a, a certain kind of cumulative power because you see how they're keeping on this track despite all of these warning signs that are popping up, not only within Washington, but nationally. You know, we were able to show how there were stories that were starting to appear in the national media about methadone's risks. Um, a newspaper in West Virginia, the Charleston Gazette, did a terrific series in 2006 about the dangers of methadone. And yet, it may as well have been in a vacuum as far as Washington was concerned. You had states like New York and Oregon that started issuing warnings to medical providers telling them about methadone and some of the danger signs, things to look out for. Again, nothing in Washington. You had states like North Carolina where they form their own preferred drug list and they make a conscious decision not to include methadone because they're too worried about the death toll. And they've done the work and they've become convinced that the risks aren't worth the benefits. Again, nothing happens in Washington. Um, it wasn't until after the series was published that Washington finally issued a warning um, and they issued an advisory not only to the pharmacists across the state but to all the medical providers saying, look, that this is a problematic drug in some respects and you need to use it with extreme care and you want to avoid using it if these other circumstances exist. Uh, they also, even though it is still technically on the preferred drug list, they've also told medical providers in continuing med medical education courses to treat it as a last-line agent instead of a first-line agent, saying if you don't have other options available, consider methadone, but don't consider it as your first option. That's and they a have dramatic been for years. Departure. I mean, that, that was the huge issue. Was this was the first drug of choice for doctors, and the state had encouraged it. And, you know, just through they they rewarded doctors by, in, in a bureaucratic way to give the drug that was cheapest, uh, less paperwork, less hassle. Any doctor who tried to go off the list had to go through these incredible gymnastics to do so. And the state actually keeps a list of how many doctors go off the list and who are the top, uh, by financial terms, who are the top 10 doctors who are going off the list. Because then they target <coughs> the doctors for special education. We need to help educate them about the merits. And, and what Ken was referenced, I mean, I think is that poor people don't get a choice on what drug they get. Uh, if they're on a Medicaid program or a state program where people with money, and that was the dots on the map, they have choices. They can buy any drug they want because they can afford to. But a lot of people don't get that luxury of, of choice. And that, that thing was the heartbeat of the story. And so our, our, I think our greatest success was that final follow-up story we had where not only did they issue the warning, but they said uh, what they had been telling Ken and I for a year, safe, as safe and effective as any other drug, they finally admitted it's not. And it was a huge admission on drug. It's not as safe and effective. We will now admit that. You guys were right. When I, I, I don't think we're mischaracterizing. It. it was intense pressure by the state and a large core of, of very distinguished doctors who were telling us we were crazy to say that there was some special uh, inherent risk with methadone. And then for them to come out and say, yes, there is a heightened risk with methadone, and we will now admit that. It was, it was you know, the, the, the best moment of the story, you know, to get that acknowledged. Well, that, yeah, that was one of the other large themes we were looking at. One was the disproportionate impact on the poor, and we were able to show that through the dots on the map. And we created an interactive graphic where people could, could scroll across the state of Washington, and we had an overlay with income areas so that you could see that in the lower income areas there were more dots, there were more deaths, and then you could pull up how old the person was, when they died, what, what their occupation was. So you were able to recognize that for each of those dots, there was a person. There was somebody who lived and died, and you got a little bit of feel for who they were personally. But the other big theme was the, the politics of healthcare in a slumping economy. 
that's a story that's playing out all over the country, uh, and not just in Washington. And one of the things that you find is that there's a certain lack of candor. Um, I, I think that it would be disingenuous to not recognize that state legislatures are in a tough spot right now. They don't have enough money to do the things that they want to do or that they feel that they're obligated to do. So they have to make some brutal decisions. But under those circumstances, I think it's especially important that they be candid about those choices. And instead of trying to rationalize them away, that they really reckon with what's going on. And in this case, if they had been transparent and said, look, we're going to methadone because it is so much less expensive than the other drugs. But before you use methadone, be aware. <coughs> know that there are certain complicating factors. And if they had issued that health advisory on the front end, if they had, had made more choices available to physicians so they really weren't in a box between methadone or morphine or nothing, I think that they could have avoided a lot of this. Um, I, I have a great deal of sympathy for state legislators these days. You know, when you see the, the dwindling tax base and you see the revenue figures, they're just an absolute decline. And, and the need for social services hasn't diminished. If anything, it's gotten, it's gotten worse. There, there's more need for social services. So yes, they have to make tough choices, but the answer isn't to do it by pretending that there isn't going to be harm and that there aren't going to be people who are hurt by it. You need to acknowledge that and try to minimize the damage by being upfront about it. I think that would have helped tremendously here. Um, one of the other things that Mike and I tried to do was not only deal with the numbers, the data writ large, but we were always trying to find telling examples that would also illustrate what was going on. And the third part of the series was about a pain clinic in Vancouver, which is in the southern part of the state, and, and some of their questionable prescribing practices. And, and Mike and I were able to find a number of examples that showed how the prescribing practices here were really um, problematic. Um, I, I think it's, it's fair to say, you, know, you, you can put it charitably. We, we found one patient who had received a, a number of methadone prescriptions from this clinic. And this is day three of the series where we've already alerted people how dangerous methadone is, you know, and how you have to take such care with it. This person had one prescription bottle that on the label said, take 10 every six hours. Mike and I saw that. We were in a lawyer's yeah. office with take 10 every six hours. When do you ever see that on a prescription bottle? And, and to see it for methadone. And not surprisingly, the, the patient died. <laughs> yeah, he, he, was, he was somebody who had overdosed <coughs> on it. Um, so that wound up being um, an art element that we blew a bit, that particular prescription bottle, because it showed the divide between the type of care that needed to be practiced and the type of prescribing practices that were actually going on in some instances. Um, we found another patient at the same clinic who in one year had received so many medications that if he had paid full price, he would have spent $209,000 on his medications that year. One patient, one year, $209,000 worth of medication. A lot of that narcotic painkillers. <coughs> We found another patient. This was a, a woman who died. She wound up overdosing on methadone. She was one of six patients at this clinic who died within a year. And five of those six patients died from methadone. In Washington, they say that there's a cautionary threshold um, with, with methadone with other painkillers. And they, they convert it into morphine equivalents. And they say that you really shouldn't take more than 120 milligrams daily if it's converted into a morphine equivalent, or if you do, then you need to check with a pain specialist and find out if this is really appropriate for this particular patient. This patient was taking, I had to write it down, 3,880 milligrams a day of painkillers. That's 32 times the state's cautionary threshold. Um, to us, you know, these were examples that just showed how out of whack it had become. And one of the reasons we wrote about this particular pain clinic was because it showed how murky the regulatory landscape was in Washington. While this pain clinic was prescribing these exorbitant amounts of painkillers, the state really felt like it was not at liberty to do much about it. At that time, there was nothing in the state regulatory code that would allow 
the, the Department of Health to discipline someone based purely on the amount of painkillers that were being prescribed. In fact, there was this kind of arm's length or hands off approach saying that, well, you can't do it just for that because we don't really know what the ceiling is or what's appropriate for this. That's changed in, in some subtle ways over the years. But pain is a real divisive, complicated subject in the medical field. You will find doctors on both sides of this issue who feel strongly that we need more pain medications prescribed, prescribed or we need less. And it's really fascinating seeing the battle lines. <coughs> and I think methadone is right at the core of it. Um, Why don't we try to take some questions? Yeah, yeah. That's great. You guys have held us in the palm of your hand, but how about <laughs> questions? Anybody? Oh, yeah. Sure. So when is methadone safe to use? Is it OK if you're a drug abuser or a heroin user too? Well, it has, it, it, it's used as a substitute for opiate addiction, but it, it's actually an effective painkiller. Uh, and it works very well as a painkiller, but as I said, it's, it's riskier than the drugs in the sense that it will react differently with each person. So when you start on methadone as a pain drug, you just need to be monitored very closely and start off on very low doses and graduate up, and you need to be told, don't take an extra dose. You know, and as Kim was alluding to in this third part of the series, we were covering the spectrum of a lot of physicians didn't understand the drug. They didn't understand the risk, and they're just giving it out wholesale and not warning people. And, and even some people who took it at very minute doses were dying. So don't be scared to take methadone per se, but understand what you're taking and, and understand the risks and errors. You mentioned that when you were um, reviewing the, the death certificates, they had the doctor's notes of excellent deaths. Are those not reported to some board or some someone to keep track of accidental deaths so they know Okay, this drug has a high instance of this, maybe we should look into something, or does that information just go off to the ether? Well, there are people in the state who look at this, but it's not necessarily public, per se. You know, it's not in the spotlight. And this is the beauty of the kind of reporting. We're taking the state's own information, death records, and we're, we're giving it back to them in a way that they haven't looked at it before. So we just count it. That's all we did is we count it. Uh, and they can't refute their own information. You know, this isn't sources said. This is their files. We just counted them. And so as reporters, I think you'll be amazed when you start delving into this as a technique, how much public information is never actually looked at very closely <laughs> or categorized. And this is the, the part about computer-assisted reporting that allows you to think of, of looking at quantifying numbers. But it's sitting out there in plain sight. It's been sitting there for years, and no one looked at it in the way that we did. Mike, how did you get the um, transcripts, and what, what lessons did that come in? Have for, uh, you know, the transcripts were incredibly difficult to get. They were posted on the web. <laughs> <laughs> they were. This was such an obscure committee that they were just so proud, I think, of themselves that they posted their transcripts on the web. And, and I'm looking and going, holy crap. <laughs> and not only did they post their transcripts on the web, and no one's ever looked at them, apparently, is, is they had audio recordings of the, the meetings. And you call them up, and they ship you an audio recording of, of the text. And we have a, a film that went with the a video that went with the project that we'll show tomorrow for lunch. But we have some of that audio you know, incorporated into our video. So it was incredibly difficult. It was just, when I say in plain sight, I am not joking. It was just sitting there. You know, it's more, what's more problematic, I think, is, is the availability of the data. You know, you were asking about, does anybody monitor this? I would be concerned if I was in a state like California, where you don't have access to these death certificate databases. Right. There are a lot of states that don't have public death certificate databases, that don't have their charge databases public. That's hospitalization admission data. In Washington, we, we get all of these things. California, California has, has yeah, California has charge, but they don't have the death certificate. They don't call it charge here, but it's it's hospital inpatient database, and it's incredibly valuable. There's a thousand stores sitting in the hospital database, and it's available like 50 bucks. But there are a lot of states where you simply can't get those records, and and it's problematic because you wonder if is the state looking at them, if other members of the public aren't, and I don't want the answers to that. Um, since the story is published, have they added other painkillers to the preferred drug list, or is it just? No, it's it's a cumbersome process. It can take a year or more to add a drug to it, and they have not done that at this point. So now that it's just. There's the, the one other drug that was also on the list that's being prescribed. Morphine, right. So instead of automatically reaching for methadone like they have done for years, they're going to give out morphine first 
and and if they do give out methadone, they're going to be monitoring it more closely, supposedly. We'll have to keep an eye on it and see if they didn't. So what seems a little bit um, worrisome and in a way infuriating is the fact that there doesn't seem to be real oversight uh, in terms of you saying that, that this committee had the power to to actually, first of all, ignore um, some telltale signs or to determine which drugs go in the preferred lists. And nobody's saying yes, no, or I mean, I just, is there, you know, so since this series or even before, I mean, how can you actually, uh, how, is there any way to make them more accountable uh, for it? I think that's and, the media. And how do you role. regulate it? I mean, that's what we do as a media, right? I mean, that's, that's our role in the, the matrix of government checks and balances. I mean, that's the free press. And that's exactly what we did. I mean, we're part of that check and balance. Should there be a government check and balance in there? I don't know. I, I don't know how you would do that exactly. The thing with this committee, uh, and it, it, you'd have to read the story to understand all the mechanics of it. Boring. The committee was a group of appointed doctors and physicians and pharmacists who were supposed to make these independent decisions and then tell the state what they had concluded. The thing is that the state control the committee and at all the committee meetings the state officials were there and whenever a topic had come up that interested the state they would intervene in the conversation and take control of it and then assure the committee now there's no problem here don't worry about it we got it under control there and so uh, there was supposed to be a check and balance built into the system it wasn't working the check and balance was broken but where does the FDA come in then I mean, they're supposed to the FDA be leaves it to the states to make their choice on drugs yeah, and the dynamics of this committee were, were important. Um, you mentioned before how a lot of the most important decisions get made in these faraway places. It, it's also important to look at who appoints the members of the committee. In this instance, it was the state agencies that had a financial stake in the committee's deliberations. It was Medicaid, it was Labor and Industries, it was the Health Care Authority. So they appointed the committee's members and they tended to dominate the committee's deliberations. When questions would arise, the questions would get kicked to members of these state agencies. They would answer them often in ways that that weren't entirely candid, that were misleading, or that didn't rely upon so information false. that was available. Sometimes just false. So these committee's members are making decisions based upon information they're receiving from the state, these state agencies. Um, it, it's always helpful, you know, I said, to know where do those members come from. And what information are they acting on? Those reporters, you know, what you do is you take an event and you deconstruct it. But if you're going to do a preferred drug list, you know, you put that up the top of your pyramid and you start deconstructing. So how does that list get made? Oh, well, it's made by this committee. Well, who appoints that committee? Oh, it's these guys. Who's got a financial interest in it? Oh, it's these guys. And you, know, you almost build like a flow chart as a reporting technique. And, and you deconstruct that event and you start finding in all the players. And that's how you start zeroing in on the zones of your reporting. Other questions? What does it happen to the use of methadone in the state of Washington since your series of errors? What's likely to happen to the use of methadone? We expect that the quantity of methadone used will go down, but the numbers lag with the EA tracks every gram of controlled substances. We have that database, but it's about three years behind, which is very frustrating with trying to track government's actions when they, you know, the most recent data is from 2007 or 2008. So. Uh, it's been a, a, a sharp upward increase on methadone use, not only in Washington, but most every state in the country. We expect it to flatline or maybe even go down a little bit in Washington, but we won't know for years. Are the numbers available, but just not? I mean, they only go up to about 2008 right now. They're public. They're public. Yeah, when we published, we were relying on figures that went up to 2006, mm -hmm. which was remarkable that they're making these important decisions with data that's five years out of date. And, and yet it continues that way all the time. Uh, so is the state being sued left and right? Not that we're aware of. I mean, it's it's hard to sue on these kinds of issues. And uh, how do you sue? I mean, I don't know what the grounds would be, but if you're a patient who was steered to methadone and not warned about it, there may be a malpractice lawsuit with the individual doctor, but I don't think the state, <coughs> with their immunity, I'm not sure that, that they're, they're even out. Yeah, you're more, tip, you're more likely to see lawsuits, which we've seen against particular physicians and clinics, but right. the state has sovereign immunity and the threshold to be able to launch a successful lawsuit against the state or against a municipal agency, it's, it's a very Keep high Keep in mind that most of the victims are, are poor. Right. And so they don't have the means or the access to resources. And how long did it take you to do this whole project beginning to end? About 10 months from beginning and from, from, from the first email. Yes. So, and I should say uh, something 
that I was remarking to Ken on the walk over here. You'll hear this particularly for you students. You know, this is a horrible time to be in journalism. Don't go in. Investigative reporting's dead. It's dying. Yeah, so I think I, I have to disagree. Uh, I think it's a wonderful time to go in, and I applaud all of you who are pursuing, you know, degrees in any kind of journalism. But I, I would argue that uh, while newspapers are going through this this traumatic contraction right now, that there is just the same level of great investigative reporting out there. And, and if you look at it, I would argue almost that the quality's gotten better. The stories. Maybe we don't have a thousand investigative stories every year. We only have 800. Those 800 are much better than the 800 from previous years in many cases. And I was looking through, uh, not only look at who the finalists were for self and writing, I mean, two superior projects. I mean, just, just incredible projects. And then you look at the investigative reporters and editors, and you look at the array of finalists, and you look at the array of stories from Sarasota to Orange County to you know, small places and big places. I mean, investigative reporting is doing well, you know, I think. Out there. There's a lot of people who crave this, and Ken and I are fortunate to work for a family-owned newspaper owned by the Bletton family that allow us the time to do this. It's, you know, we don't sell any ads for writing stories about methadone in the Seattle Times. <laughs> we didn't make any money off this project. It's fair to say that we cost the paper a lot of money. Yes? Uh, reviewing your data, you had mountains and piles of numbers and data. Mm -hmm. How often and how long did you go back to check, recheck a point? Or we recheck right up till the last day of publication. But another safeguard that we do, and this is something that I think Ken and I both strongly believe in, we sent our numbers to the state. We should, before we did a graphic, before we had a total, we sent all the numbers off the state and said, here's what we found, prove us wrong. And, and we do this with every project. Uh, we fact check. There are, there are some reporters who believe that, you know, you'll see my story when you see it on Sunday. You know, they, they you know, surprise. Uh, there's no surprises in our stories with the people we're writing about, no matter how negative they may perceive it. We have vetted every word, every verb with them uh, on the phone or in some manner. And, and Kim and I feel well, strongly about that, I think. Yeah, Mike not only shares the numbers, he shares his methodology. So the state's epidemiologists, if they have any concerns about the way that we reach those numbers, they can voice that to us before publication instead of after. Yeah, that, that helps immensely. There's and nothing wrong with that. Yeah. No, I mean, don't be afraid to sh tell people. I mean, some people like to think investigative reporting is stealth reporting. Mm -hmm. We knock on the door from the very first moment and say, hi, Mike Barron, Seattle Times, I'm going to do a story about methadone and your preferred drug list. They knew from the very beginning what we were doing. And it actually helps you because it spreads the word and people will contact you. But you know, very seldom do we operate in total stealth or try to pretend that we're doing this one kind of story when we're doing another. That's just, it does, you don't need to work that way. One last question from the <coughs> Uh, this might be a very naive question because I don't know the specifics of uh, the work of the investigative uh, uh, journalist. But are you expecting any uh, difficulties or problems for you later on to work in the same area uh, of service, healthcare, or whatever? And they, is there any danger that they will just kind of put a red flag, red flag on you and not? I find quite the opposite that when you have the reputation of being fierce and independent in your reporting, but also being fair and accurate, it, it, when you go to do your next story, people really pay attention to you. You know, I'm doing a project now on something that isn't healthcare related, and but they're very well aware of the stories that I've done in the past, and I'm getting a lot better cooperation because they, they know that if they lie to me, they're going to pay a horrible price for it <laughs> in the paper, you know, because we do make people pay for their public statements in the sense of, we'll quote you, you know, if you want to say methadone is safe and effective, we'll quote you, and then we'll have our numbers showing, you know, what your own data shows. So I think it's a help. I think also the more times you do stories where you're relying on the Public Records Act and you get agencies accustomed to knowing what the intricacies of the act are, what are the exemptions, when do they apply, you, it becomes easier as you go along because they're less likely to fight you over the, the, on the battlegrounds where they're going to lose. Um, and in Washington, we have a good Public Records Act, and the agencies now have a pretty good culture of complying. We tend to get records fairly quickly. They don't tend to cite exemptions frivolously that much anymore because the newspaper has filed lawsuits um, in the past, and usually when we sue, we win. And I, I think that a lot of the agencies realize it's just easier to comply with us than instead of fighting when they, they know that ultimately they're going to lose. So I, I found that as time has gone on, it's become easier 
to do these types of stories in Washington. Well, you said nobody is going to make any money off of this, but tomorrow we're giving you the <laughs> 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 <laughs>